Okay, this is the Art Car Museum. They call it the Garage Hall. Jim Harithus is the owner of it, and he has been wonderful at creating this space for the local community. And there's never a cover charge. And this, these pieces here have come from the last exhibition. Uh, his name is Mark Scrap Daddy Bradford. And these are a lot of the vehicles that have been in the art car parade. This is all made from spoons. So we're going in, I'm going to interview Andy Feehan, who is one of our artists who about five years ago moved away with his family, his four boys and his wife, to uh, France and luckily he's here and I'm going to interview him in front of his work so he can talk about it. Hey Andy. Hi Melissa. So are you ready to tell me a little bit about your work? Ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> this well, was 20 years old. I'll try to remember what I was thinking at, at the time. But um, Didn't you tell me it had something to do with your dad? Uh, not exactly. Um, um, no, not this one. Um, <clears throat> this is a painting that is the graphic result of a lot of things that I was reading about alchemy. And um, I wanted to reduce some ideas that um, were from divergent sources. Uh, I wanted to reduce these ideas into uh, a simple graphic representation and um, I did it with geometry and uh, this is a, a combination of different ideas that uh, I harmonized I hope into one sort of syncretic whole and it's hard to talk about without um, reducing it to a um, something unintelligible, okay, so I'll, I'll do my best. Um, let's see, where can I start? <clears throat> these four down here, these four dots, three more there, two there, and one more at the top, are a, a device called the tetractis. And that, the tetractis is a, <clears throat> a, an idea that was formulated by uh, Pythagoras in the 6th century BC. And Pythagoras, among many other things, tried to explain or understand the world with a system, and he saw things mathematically, as we might remember from some of the things we learned in high school, the Pythagorean theorem and stuff, which really wasn't his, but it's called that. It was known earlier, but the numbers four, three, two, and one add up to ten. And to the Pythagoreans, the number ten was perfection. And it also um, agrees with some notions in uh, the Kabbalah uh, and other humanistic ideas in Europe that were not necessarily Jewish or they weren't Christian. They were sort of a pagan thing. Um, but you can see even in the 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 notion, the linguistic, the roots of counting, what we call numbers. Number 10 is perfection. It was reserved, it belonged to God. Uh, nine is the number of man. He's almost there. And you can hear, it's also has to do with renewal. The number nine, uh, German, uh, neun, French, neuf, uh, Spanish, nueve, you know? Um, it's, it means renewal. There's a, a source between the number nine and the idea of, of renewal. And perfection, of course, is ten, and it starts over again. Okay? That's just one little thing. The rest, I mean, there's the, 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 the Magen David, if you, if you are a Jew and you recognize that, great. But there's some other stuff that has to do with um, our chemical symbolism with fire and water. And male and female, you know, a, a yoni is um, there's there she is right there. It's water, she's blue. Here's a here, here's a man. He's red. <laughs> um, and the two is the harmony of 
male and female, fire and water, um, the uh, unification of, of opposites. I mean, I mean, that's why marriage is so damn difficult. <laughs> Because it's fire and water, okay? <laughs> you gotta work at it. Anyway, um, there's also a, a, a mystery behind the idea of uh, squaring the circle, okay? Um, four and four <laughs> within a circle, um, lit on fire. It's just a, it's just what I was thinking 20 years ago when, when, um, I wanted to create a graphic notion of what ultimately cannot be understood. And, and, and I don't even understand it anymore myself. <laughs> I thought I did when I made it, but, but uh, um, that's all it is. It's just my attempt to harmonize lots of different ideas to one notion of the truth, or my truth at the time. My truth, not everybody's truth, just an attempt to understand lots of different things coming from lots of different places, reduce that to something approaching universality. When, when, you, uh, when you look at this painting, does it immediately take you back to that period? Yeah, it does. And like the smells, the flavors, what, where you were living, well, uh, what um, you were feeling? Yeah, sure. Um, it's like a landmark in your life. In the late 1980s, I really changed my approach to what I was doing. Um, painting wise. Painting wise. And um, um, I just turned inward and I stopped making paintings about politics and about the world and about culture and I stopped criticizing things and I started working on myself and I still am working on myself. And That's you were a, working at a library at the time. Yeah, yeah. So you had access to a lot of literature that I, other people wouldn't be exposed to. So <clears> you were reading... As much as I could get my hands on. And what wasn't in the library at the time, I borrowed from other libraries. I spent 22 years in the Houston Public Library. Um, and I never made any money, but I, I got a real good education. Can you get insurance? <laughs> <laughs> well, um... That was, I'm, I'm done now, and, I, and I'm... I'm uh, so what were the books you, you were looking at that influenced this work to come um, from those... Oh, gosh. Not specifically, but the genre. I started on this inward quest. That sounds kind of trite to use that no, phrase. Everybody goes through it. Um, right around the age of 40, I mean, there it is, the predictable middle of the road, middle of life or whatever. It wasn't that I had a crisis, maybe I did. I, I mean, heck, I have a crisis every day. <laughs> no, but what? what? But no, I, I, it was Carl Jung. Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell. Um, those guys, um, Campbell f at first, because he was the most um, ubiquitous author dealing with mythology and the, the four volumes of of uh, the Master of God really got me started. And he was a great scholar, and, and he, his uh, bibliographies were terrific. He, he never got a PhD, but he worked very close to it and then just blew off the PhD. He got the education. He spoke medieval French, he spoke low German, he spoke high German, he read Greek, he read Sanskrit. He read the original sources of the stuff that he was uh, writing about. He knew what he was talking about, and he had great admiration for Carl Jung. He helped Jung's uh, collected works get published in the United States with, a, with a, the Bollingen Foundation. Um, and Bollingen, he was on the board of Bollingen, and Bollingen's money came from Paul Mellon, you know, Andrew Mellon, the steel magnate's uh, family. Paul Mellon was having some psychological problems uh, and he, he knew Joseph Campbell and Campbell said, go to Zurich and see Carl Jung. And he was so impressed with, uh, with Jung's ideas that he endowed this foundation with millions of dollars to publish all of Jung's work. That's how I got a hold of Jung. I, I, I bought collected works and I borrowed collected works. There's three or four books by Jung that are about alchemy. And Jung was a great scholar too. He was a, a physician. Uh, uh, so it was the whole student. 
to the Freud. I mean, he was an MD and, and, and uh, he's a psychiatrist. So the alchemy is what hooked you? Yes. And, you know, most people think of alchemy, of course, when they learn about science, uh, alchemy as some sort of primitive, ignorant, um, bad um, chemistry. It's not, it's not that at all. Not anymore. I mean, of course not. But but when I was a kid, that's what I was told. And 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 I, then I began to understand through through Campbell and through Jung that um, it was about an inward uh, experience. And the things that the alchemists were writing and talking about were written in this arcane language, uh, partly to disguise what they were doing, but to 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 make the uninitiated or the the average yay who go away it was just i can't understand this i'm just gonna you know and also to protect them from uh charges of uh of uh, blasphemy and that sort of thing so they invented the symbolic language they invented a vocabulary of symbols of of art of of words uh and and jung got the original primary sources and he explored them he spent his life dealing with them and I got exposed to that through Jung, and, and Jung read Latin and Greek, and I was raised as a Catholic, and I read some Latin as a choir boy, and I studied a little, and I taught myself enough Greek to understand what Jung was writing about, and besides, it was always translated. Um, Jung's work was translated into English. He wrote it up this all in German, but it was very well translated, and I can't remember the translator's name, but it doesn't matter but the Greek and the Latin footnotes were there. So I got a hold of all that stuff and I went and found a lot of the primary sources of Jung. And I didn't get to the primary sources because they're in European libraries and I was living in Texas, but I found publications that had those sources in them. And um, I, I, I just had a great old time reading <laughs> about everything from Pythagoras uh, to, you know, uh, Michael Meyer, uh, some of the, the ideas in the late 19th century, the theosophists, a lot of the theosophical stuff is sort of bogus, but, but there was still an, an earnest effort at understanding some sort of underlying truth about what it is to be here. And they were so much. Jung himself said that, that, that the East and the West will never meet. He, he thought that the, the Western students of yoga and uh, um, just the whole uh, Indian subcontinent, any Westerner who tried to understand that was doomed to fail because of his genetic makeup, because he was n not of the ground from which that sprang. And, and I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but he, he didn't think that anybody from the West could truly understand either Buddhism or or Hinduism in any form. He thought we could study it, but we'd always be dilettantes, um, and we would never really, really be able to wear the cloth of of that part of the world. And that's not true at all. You know, um, uh, Jung didn't live long enough to see that, but there's plenty of great Buddhist scholars and practitioners, and they're not Tibetan. They're not Chinese, they're not Japanese, they're American, and they're great. <laughs> and on that note, we'll, we'll go to your other uh, okay. painting. And uh, while we're on our way there, um, I want you to talk about the, your musician world and what you were doing here while you were in Houston. Well, um, You were playing with the Na Herschel Berry and the Natives, and this is Herschel's piece right here. That's right. I started off in high school playing with Ronnie Bond and uh, Kelly Younger, who later after our band in high school, our band in high school was called The Lords, and we were just kids. We didn't know what we were doing, but we had a lot of fun. Uh, Ronnie and Kelly formed Really Red a few years after that. And that's that. the band that I had play for the Diverse Works first fundraiser at Lawndale. Okay. Remember that? Yes. I put you behind a big movie screen. Yeah. And <laughs> I was, 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 I was with, did I play with Herschel then, or the Haskells, or I don't remember. I don't know, you were really Probably. red. It was really red. Oh, well, um, I was playing with Herschel for a while while Really Webb was pl together, and then um, I played with the Haskells at this later, 
Really Red was still together. And um, so Ronnie Kelly formed the punk band, and I was never uh, quite chronically angry enough to, 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 to play punk? like that. I mean, Ronnie and I are still friends. I see Kelly sometimes once in a while. I communicate with him. He's in Texas and I'm in Europe, but Ronnie lives in Seattle. Ronnie's politics are just as red as they, as they were <laughs> when he was playing music. And, and I'm more radical now than I ever was politically. Um, you know, I, I would probably, if I had the juice and I was 20, I'd probably be screaming and hollering and, and I wouldn't be quite so nice with my music as I was. So I played pop music and I, I didn't scream and holler and bitch about the world. Mm -hmm. I was just having a, a good time. Are you still uh, playing? I when play you're with in my France? boys. I play sometimes. I play guitar with my sons. I've got uh, three sons who play the guitar, and a fourth son who probably will pick it up. But he's he's still young, and he and he's um, just thinking about stuff. He you know. But three of the four right now are very very interested in the guitar, and um, and uh, I'm 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 happy to have all that music in the house. It's so great. And uh, they're all better than I am anyway, and they're still kids. Well, you're you know. too busy fixing up your house. <laughs> yeah, I am. Okay, let's go over to your painting. We've got... Okay, now, uh, opening night, Butch Hancock was here, and he really dug this painting. And yeah. I am so excited to have this. You hadn't seen it in 20 years because it, it's owned by somebody, a collector. Yeah, uh, I, I sold it from a show at uh, the Lynn Good Gallery in 1991. Um, it is owned by uh, B.J. Kilbride, and, uh, and I've never met B.J. I, I'd like to, and she very graciously lent the painting to the Art Car Museum. And, um, I was hoping to meet her here, but I think she's out of town. Yes. Yeah, um, so um, this was another painting that had to do with what I read, and um, I I wasn't trying to be uh, cagey or difficult because I wrote all this stuff in Latin and Greek, but in a way I was. I <laughs> I, I wanted to write what I was reading, and I wanted to be a little bit obtuse or mysterious and um, if people really want to know with the technology the way it is now they can find out what it is I'm, I'm talking about these are all from alchemical texts and they have to do with psychological transformation and people who have looked at some of these books on alchemy now there's lots of books on alchemy published now but 20 years ago there weren't that many and um, a lot of these images you'll you'll see and you'll recognize um, um, the the uh, Ouroboros, um, the snake eating its tail. Um, uh, it's another um, reference to the infinite, you know, the thing that just consumes itself and spits itself back out, or uh, the beginning and the end being the same, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I can't explain everything in here, but, but it, I'll just let a lot of it speak for itself and, and if it doesn't speak for itself let it be a mystery it's not for me to decipher or explain except to say that you recognize a, a vocabulary here from some of the sources that have to do with alchemy here, here's, here's Pythagoras's uh, Tetractis again 4 and 3 and 2 and 1 adds up to 10 and um, it's also a equilateral triangle if you put it together that way and that, that's a uh, something interesting as well. Um, I mean, I can translate a couple of these things. Um, I don't have my glasses on. What does it say? Uh, um, don't. In stercore invenitur, okay? It is found in shit. That's what that says. In stercore invenitur, it is found in filth. Don't want to say shit. Well, that's what it means. It means um, in the darkest part of ourselves is the best part but you have to work on it mm -hmm. you know you know it's like the the diamond in the dunghill and all that stuff you know that's what these guys were saying 600 years ago you know 
Look inside yourself. Don't look somewhere else. And all the things that they were saying about what they thought was happening in the, in the flasks and the retorts and the alembics, they were projecting their own thoughts and ideas and feelings into what they were looking at. And they wrote what some people would have called bad science, but it was an amazing uh, exploration of the psychic contents of the alchemists themselves. And as they were also attempting to reconcile the prevailing notion that, that God was somewhere else and had left and had, had um, left us uh, to sort of fend for ourselves only through the salvation of Jesus, et cetera, et cetera. And what the alchemists, many of them were trying to do was, was um, find the soul in the world. And often when they burned or, or boiled things in, in flasks, they literally thought they were releasing the spirit of the material as a physical thing. And when they saw steam coming out, they would think about it as not as, as vapor, the way we think of an, an amalgamation of, of matter, but as a, some of them thought of it that way and they understood it that way, but they were trying to find the spirit inside matter and they were trying to release the spirit that was in matter and you know you can laugh at that notion now but but modern science has been dry and uh and really kind of flat and now of course with subatomic particle physics and all that sort of thing people are on the micro the nano level and on the giant infinitely huge universal level things are different uh, and in between the nano level and the infinitely huge level is, is uh, you know, Isaac Newton's physics, but on both sides of Newton, smaller and bigger is another way of thinking. And, and uh, it's a, that's where the edge of, of our spirit ought to be, you know, thinking about the unity of everything and the fact that we're not separate, that we're all uh, one thing. And you can see in the work of these alchemists that they said that exact same thing. Through symbolism and metaphor. Yes, they said this is all one thing. Mm -hmm. It is not separate. It is not damned. It is not imperfect. And it never needed to be saved in the first place because it was already perfect. It's not a problem. You know, Duchamp said there is no solution because there is no problem. <laughs> and um, so, you know, that's really all this is. But I had fun exploring these old writers' work, and um, I wanted to do a painting that um, was about my own exploration of it. And, and it does read more or less from the upper left down around uh, to the bottom. Um, and this is sort of like the, the pit of, of my own psychological um, experience, and, and I wanted to sort of raise the level of things until it's not that it makes an exit out of here but but some sort of um, well it's the full circle yeah it's a circle and and it's not that the circle is finished but it's it's a notion of it's this it's a notion of completion the that's right the beginning is the end and uh and and the end is the beginning and you know you can start anywhere on this painting and it's fine. You don't have to start at, at square one. There is no square one. But you can explore it in sort of a counterclockwise way. You can go clockwise too if you want. It's okay. So Andy, tell me what it's been like to come back here. How many years has it been since you've been here? Uh, well, I, I was here three years ago, uh, just for a little while. Um, but you weren't here for an art opening. No, I was here for something for Diverse Works. Um, they actually um, they had a little fundraiser dinner, and I was oh, invited right. to come. Um, and oh, that's the one I didn't make it to. <laughs> well, I used to have breakfast every Friday with Earl Staley and Jack Boynton and Harvey Bott and David Gray and Bill Camfield, the professor emeritus of art history at Rice. Uh, and um, we sort of... Um, 
I don't know what they were trying to say something that they thought it was really great that we I don't know it was weird they called me up and said we're gonna give you an award for for having breakfast once a week and I said what <laughs> and it was like they, I don't know what they call it so the breakfast club the, or something the but. Saturday night event and coming back here with your son well uh,